All right. <clears throat> Welcome. Let's see. Hooray, I have my sound effects working again. Uh, let's see, first thing first, before I get back into my uh, solitude transcription, um, just a little bit, I was out walking the dogs, uh, and I was reading my book, uh, Pierce Plowman by William Langland, a book from the 14th century in England, uh, writing about, um, it's actually an epic poem, and it was writing about um, <clears throat> the life of uh, people back then, and it's particularly puts together an interesting circumstance by which um, the king of England is being uh, challenged with a uh, basically a moral dilemma. And, it, and we have the various uh, components of morality uh, and life, and namely reason, conscience, um, prudence, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, there's one called mead, which is compensation. Mead is the centerpiece. Meet is, is characterized as a woman, and uh, she is basically under trial here, and she's mainly against against uh, uh, under with the king, and uh, conscience is involved as well, and all kinds of things. It's very interesting. It's a little hard to follow because it's it's so it's just steeped in religion, um, and you really almost have to put yourself into the into the into a fourteenth century mindset where. You know, just imagine in 14th century England. I mean, religion was just everything in your in your in your life. You really have to have that frame of mind to really to really be able to follow this. So I have to when I'm reading this book, I almost have to disjoint myself from my my current circumstance and try to superimpose the my 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 religion goggles over my mind. Anyway, there's a bit here, and I, I'm afraid I didn't. I didn't highlight it. Usually, I keep two pens with me when I'm reading uh, a, a pink one here to highlight words that I don't know, and a yellow one for passages that are interesting. And I just read it while I was walking the dogs, and I failed to highlight it, so I probably can't find it again. Uh, but it is—I'll I'll bring it up on the screen here—the <clears throat> term "cuckled horns." Now, probably just about everybody that sees this is familiar with the term "cuckled," um, and and the more derogatory. Uh, uh, word cuck, you know, to be called for a man to be called a cuck is no small thing. Them is fighting words to be sure. So, but anyway, I had never heard, and he was referring here, he was referring to there was a case here where uh, Mead really is. Let's see if I can find it. Find it. Mead is, is not someone who you want to trust. Here it is, right here. I just found it. Let me highlight it. Basically, the king is trying to marry Mead to conscience. Is it conscience? Yeah, conscience. Trying to marry, basically, Mead is under trial. And to, to sum it up, Mead is kind of. She's she's embodied the, the concept of of compensation. Now there's there's type of a, a due compensation that comes of of normal barter and exchange and, and course of living. And then there's this type of compensation that's kind of an excess. And there's a lot of discussion here in, in the book about um, indulgences. Where in the the church and and the, the Catholic Church in particular is receiving compensation. And its ministers and <laughs> ministers, it's I admit that in the in the more the term of someone that 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 runs it right, are being compensated for uh, this the forgiveness of sins. So that's the other that's the other term that these they're using mead mead as the undue or un or the unjust or un what would it be a kind of a compensation that is not. On the up and up, <laughs> so the king offers to marry Mead to Conscience, who objects and says, "No way, I would have her." And he has this long soliloquy. Here he is. Here's Conscience. 
Um, well, it is. I won't. I won't read it. But there's there's a long thing about conscious. Like this woman, no, I wouldn't have her for anything. Finally, um, Mead is. He here's here's what I think this is reason speaking. Yeah, reason says here's here's what he says of Mead. He says, believe me. And but by the way, this used this was originally written in an epic poem, but this version's been translated into into prose, so it's a lot easier to read. <clears throat> um, believe me, whoever wants to marry Mead for her money and possessions can rest assured of a pair of cuckold horns. If I'm proved wrong, you're free to cut off my nose. And the the, the word the two the phrase cuckold horns I'd never heard that I'd heard of cuckold and I've heard the nasty word cuck before, but I'd never heard cuckold horn so i had to look it up and um let me show you what i found i thought it was interesting um over here okay so make that a little bit bigger so this is over in uh, uh reddit what is the connection between uh cuckolds and horns i searched but uh, nothing seems to explain it in a clear way so this person responds three years ago in, in English to wear the horns means to be cuckled in Portuguese to place the horns on someone means to cuckled him in Italian. A husband who is cheated on is called a cornuto, a horned one. The important point is that the horns are not the husband's own. They are placed there by another man. It's interesting. Horns are equated to virility an association probably related to fights between rams and or stags during mating season. When the man cuckolds another, he figuratively places a pair of horns, in fact, his genitalia, on the husband's head, symbolizing his emasculation and loss of authority over his wife. What an interesting thing. So the cuckold horns would be would be that symbolic thing. So this, this whole thing about the, the horns like this, uh, apparently that actually has, has its origins in not devil, but <clears throat> a cuckold man. I guess referring to another, you maybe 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 the way it would work is that we would be referring to someone else talking about someone in, in such a way and say, you know, actually, you know, he's kind of like a little like that. <laughs> maybe that's that's the way it's used. Very interesting. It's a new term for me. So with that, I'm gonna get on with my oh, I forgot to do something here. Over here, I forgot to go into over on discord i need to go into the voice channel on air there we go all right let's get back to it i'm going to continue now with my uh, um now that we've finished talking about cuckold horns <laughs> let's talk now let's continue working on uh, the solitude transcription i am now i finished page 38 this morning moving on to page 39 which is all jangled there it's a little hard to see oh it's not showing on the screen just a second there we go do, do, do. let's get all the way to the bottom okay got a number of words there the high, ones highlighted in yellow from this morning that i just not confident in let's go ahead and uh, insert a page break and we're going to carry on that first word there looks like greatness, does it not? So does that carry over from the previous sentence? Renounce the smiles of greatness. Great. Okay, here we go. Center sounds. There we go. Lightweight. Oh, we got to move that up to ten point five.
That's a couple of interesting things there. So first, what is a seductive blandishment? What is a blandishment, I wonder? A blandishment. I've never heard that term. Let's look it up. Blandishment. A flattering or pleasing statement or action used to persuade someone gently to do something. Blandishment. And all the seductive blandishments of an imperial court to enjoy his happy muse among the romantic wilds of his sequestered villa of Tiber near Lake. If we can find where this Lake Albunia is, shall we? us into the right area but didn't give us the anything let's try lake albunia uh, lots of stuff in colombia not albania come on are you gonna find it where are we going now it really confused confused google now let's see if we can find it in google earth at least it can get confused um yeah did i spell it wrong Crab. Did I spell it wrong? Uh, A L B U N E A, right? A L B U N E A. Let's try that. I got it right. Roman white sibyl, prophetess in God. God. And Oracle. Hmm. Let's try Tiber. Let's have the word Tiber. Dictionary of Greek and Ro Roman geography. Huh. Could it be an archaic, an archaic reference? An ancient and celebrated town. This is Tiber. Okay, Tiber. An ancient and celebrated town of Latium, seated on the Anio in the northeast of Rome, from which it was distant 20, 20 miles from Rome. Tiber lies is a, on an offshoot or spur thrown out from the northern side of what is now called Mont Ripoli. At a what is now called, so let's look up this Mont Ripoli. Because we know, we have a, a we have a, actually a place name that might help us out at a level between eight hundred and nine hundred feet above sea level. Let's extend the valley. Let's take a look. In Italy, which is where we want to be. Okay. What in the world is this? I don't see a river. So this must be the general area, at least. So just let's just imagine back in the day when this was. Look, look at that. Looks like an old. Doesn't it look like an old quarry or something? I wonder what this is. Do you think this could be an old Roman quarry? I, I'm totally guessing. I wonder if we get a street view out of this. Oh, wow. Look at those old beat up cars. Hmm. Let's try again. Come on, we're looking.
walking through a fence? It's like we were underground there, huh? Come on, birds through. Okay, wow. So it's, it's, it's giving us a street view, but it's still using that satellite gem imagery all, all kind of messed up. So I think we're good on that, right? So we now know that Tiber is is near Lake. Is there a lake nearby that? Let's take let's take a look. If we can see a lake. That's the wrong thing. Is there a lake anywhere nearby? What's this lake? Lake. No, that's not it. All right. Well, we kind of draw a dead end there, but we have the general idea about the area there. Okay. Make sure I've got the spelling right. A L B U N E A. Draw, 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 Slian. Let's see if we can find who this is. She appeared to have passed the concluding scenes of life with more real dignity than Emperor Draw Slian. Dio, di, no, okay, so let's use that. Let's see if the time is right. The time is right. 248, 284 to 305 BC. So let's correct the spelling. How is that so different? Diocletian, Diocletian. Dio, that, that is it. It's just, I just, that's an I, not an R. I mistook that for an R. Thank you, Google, for setting me up straight. Let's learn about him. Diocletian. 244 to 311 was Roman emperor from 248 to 305. So he was emperor when he was four. Born to a family of low status in Dalmatia, Diocletian rose to the ranks of the military to become a cavalry commander of the Emperor Carsus's army. After the deaths of Carsius and his son Numerian on campaign in Persia, we met we actually think we met Numerian this morning when we were doing our, our study. Diocletian was proclaimed emperor. Why? <laughs> the title was also claimed by Carus Carus's surviving son Carin Carinus, but Diocletian defeated him in the Battle of the Margus. Diocletian's reign stabilized the empire, empire and ended the crisis of the third century. He appointed fellow officer Maximilian as Augustus, or co-emperor, in 286. Diocletian reigned in the Eastern Empire and Maximilian reigned in the Western Empire. Diocletian delegated further on March 1st, 293, appointing these two guys as junior co-emperors. Wow, each with the title Caesar. So interesting how he's kind of seems to be eager to relinquish power. Huh? Diocletian.
All right. Well, what we're reading here is just what we uh, read about Diocletian, namely that in the first in the twenty first year of his reign, though he had never practiced the lessons of philosophy, either in the attainment or the use of supreme power, maybe an allusion there to uh, Marcus Aurelius. Let's see when was Marcus Aurelius? Marcus Aurelius. I can't remember when he lived. Was this before Diocletian? No, he was after. Okay, so. He never practiced the lessons of philosophy, either in the attainment or the use of supreme power. And although his reign had flowed with a tide of uninterrupted success, he executed his memorable resolution of abdicating the empire and gave the world the first example of a resignation which has not been very frequently imitated by succeeding monarchs. Interesting. I wonder why he did that. Did you see how he, they spelt it with an S where it should have been, a, where it was a T here in modern usage? That's why it's not getting it. Period. Only. So we spell that differently. Must be the Br British spelling. of the world. Diocletian was at this period only 59 years of age and in the full possession of his mental faculties. But he had vanquished all his enemies and executed all his designs. And his active life, his wars, his journeys, the cares of royalty, and his application to business, having impaired his constitution and brought 
missing a T. On the infirmities of a premature old age, he resolved to pass the remainder of his days in honorable repose, to place his glory beyond the reach of fortune, and to relinquish the theater of the world to his younger and more active associates. Okay, I get the I get the impression I get the understanding now why he did what he did. Ceremony of his abdication was performed in a spacious plain about three miles from Nico, Nicomedia. N I C O M E D I A. Let's see if we can find that place. And miles from it. There's Nicom, Nicomida. Ooh, look at that. Do you see what I see over here? Isn't that a uh, Colosseum? It is a Roman Colosseum. Look at that. Can you imagine living in a place where something like this is just part and parcel of the community? Wow. I wonder if we can get a closer look. Wow. Can you imagine being like one of these people that like live right there? I wonder if we can go closer. Hmm. Not much to see. Okay, so did it say three miles to the east? just three miles, a plane, three miles, about three miles from Nicomedia. Let's see if we can find that. So now that we've got Nicomedia, we, we can probably assume that this Colosseum was at the center of the community. Look at this over here. <laughs> An old amphitheater of some sort, right? So this place had it all. It had the uh, Colosseum, the amphitheater. David says, cool. Yeah, that is. It's amazing. Rome. <laughs> so a plane about three miles from there. Let's see if we can get out our little measure, measure sticky thing. Okay, we're going to choose uh, miles. Did it say three miles? It did. Let's see from here. Let's, choose, let's imagine that this is the center of, of the community, this area right here, This where the Colosseum is. So let's go about three miles out. Ah, hit the thing too soon. So that's too far. This could be it out here, huh? I wish I could move this out of the way. Let's move that out of the way. That's about three miles right there. So it could be out here by but but by Falaska, unless that didn't exist at the time. Maybe it could be over here. That's about four miles. So it could be anywhere out here, huh? Look at that. It's like a radar scooping around three miles out. Hey David, can you answer a question for me? Is the sound of the rain too loud coming through relative to my voice? I'm trying to dial in the audio for these things. Okay, so three miles. Clear. So this is where the emperor then abdicated. So he said he was the eastern emperor, right? So this would be on the eastern part 
of the Roman. Yeah, that would be the Eastern Empire because the Western Empire of the Western Roman Empire would have been over here. It's good. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you, David. So the audio sounds good. Can you hear the can you hear the rain clearly? Does it sound like rain? I've had situations where the sound kind of sounds weird, you know? I'm sorry to use you for my sound check person. <laughs> hmm. That was fun. I think we've got this other page done. The dogs look like they're cool. They don't need another 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 walk. Let's I'm gonna go for another page. It's only it's only twelve o'clock. So we'll go down here. Insert uh, page break. Oh, Ollie's back. Well, do you want to go for another walk? You want to come up on my lap? Come on. You want to go? Maybe the dog wants another walk. David says, I knew the rain stopped and thought it was odd to hear rain. Yeah, that's actually a recording of some rain in uh, Thailand, of all places. So I, I got it. It's, it goes for an hour. So I like to listen to it when I'm when I'm doing this kind of stuff. It gives me a little background sound. And you're from Southern California too, yeah. So you know, you know how rare it is that we actually get to hear that kind of thing. All right. Well, actually, I've finished this page, and the dogs are look like they're wanting another walk or something, some attention or some playing. So I'm going to stop for now. Uh, thanks, David, for your help with the uh, sound check. I'll turn that off. I do appreciate it. We've made one more page of progress in uh, Solitude by J.G. Zimmerman. Uh, let's go ahead and save that. Leave this up and running. The lights. And uh, call it a day, or at least, or at least an afternoon. And um, I'll be back later maybe to do some more on the page. We'll see how time goes today. Thanks, David, for your help with the sound check and all. Have a good day now.